my presentation here. Um, so we're going to uh, talk a little bit about planting a pecan tree, maintenance for homeowners, uh, some variety selection, things like that. So the first thing we need to kind of do is talk about a little bit about pecans in general. Um, kind of what to expect from your pecan trees or kind of what you um, what you can expect or what, you know, depending upon your management level, of course. Um, you know, if you just throw them out there and don't do anything to them for the rest, you know, for the rest of their life, you know, you may not get quite this production or quite this yield, um, you know, and it may take a little longer time to the bearing and some things like that. But uh, typically a lot of people, especially with the price of pecans these days, a lot of people are interested in planting a couple of pecan trees, maybe not a, um, you know, a whole orchard, but just having a couple around their yard, or they may have some that they're not sure exactly what variety it is. They just kind of inherited these that were in their landscape um, when they bought the property, or, you know, they may be trying to rejuvenate some older trees that they've, that they've got on their property. So uh, a little bit about pecans, typically, uh, you're going to take, it's going to take seven to 12 years for them to uh, start bearing nuts. So, you know, of course that depends on the variety and your environmental conditions as well as your management um, techniques and management style or management level. So obviously the lower the management level that you're going to be putting into them, the little bit longer it may take to, uh, to become bearing for those trees. Um, but some type of management is typically essential to a su to success in producing nuts and a you know a amount of nuts that you'll be uh, pleased with and are looking for. Uh, you know, you, yeah, you sure you could just set them out there like another tree if you're just looking to have that you know a messy tree in your landscape like a pecan can be a lot of times, just always dropping limbs and um, leaves and that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, they're not typically the, the cleanest of trees or the, uh, the, the best landscape tree, but a lot of times that's just what we're stuck with and what we've already got there. And uh, it's a, already a mature tree when we inherit it. So um, we don't, you know, may not want to take the time to, to kind of start over. But a uh, typical pecan tree can, any, you know, managed well. Um, you know, with a medium to high inputs, uh, can yield 75 to 100 pounds of nuts per tree. Again, this is gonna be a little bit higher, on the higher end of the management style or the management input. Um, so, you know, if you don't, if you just set it out there and forget about it, uh, or you have, you know, some native pecans, something like that, that you're just um, in, the, in the woods next to your house that you're not really maintaining, uh, you probably won't see quite that yield, but um, and pecan trees are typically what we can consider alternate bearing, where um, some years they may produce uh, a pretty good yield, and then some years they may not produce much of anything at all, um, or very limited amount of nuts or pecans. So just something to bear in mind that you know you're not always going to yield this 75 to 100 pounds even with good management, you may not, depending on your, uh, the environmental conditions and uh, some things like that, insect pest and disease, which can be a, um, an issue for homeowners to consider in spraying a you know, 50 to 70 foot tall tree um, can, can sometimes be of issue. So um, just kind of know that going into it. And that's why a lot of times um, inheriting trees can sometimes be a, um, can be a difficult issue because uh, you don't know really know the variety and they may not have the they may be an older variety that does not have all of the um, bred genetics uh, into them as far as disease and resistance and that sort of thing so uh, just know that going into it and um, and you'll you'll be a little more successful or be a little less surprised at what it takes to get out of it so where do we want to plant uh, when we're thinking about planting some pine tree or planting some pecan trees? You know, if we're, we're these are obviously not um, the ones that we've inherited. This is if we're thinking about planting some in our landscape and uh, just want to 
have a little time that we're thinking about staying in the same place, like I said, for seven to 12 years before they start bearing. Um, we obviously want to keep, think of our soil, obviously is going to be the most important place, uh, more, most important part of the whole, kind of the whole puzzle to, to choosing of uh, the place where we want to plant these. We need a very deep, well-drained soil. Um, pecan trees do produce a tap root and uh, they do have an extensive root system, feeder root system that can sometimes go three to six feet. Uh, and the tap root can sometimes even go longer, that further deeper than that. So obviously a good deep soil without a fragile pan or a hard pan or you know bedrock, something like that, a real shallow soil is not the best in, not the best option for planting pecan trees in. Uh, you're gonna have issues with uprooting, uh, especially once they get to be large trees, things like that. The wind can, um, you know, the shape of pecan trees typically can catch a lot of wind. And if they're not, don't have that good solid tap root, they can get blown over pretty easily. We wanna make sure we avoid any low lying areas uh, and it, those excessively wet soils where water tends to to pool up and um, you know just become a sac just stay saturated uh, that's uh, you know pecans obviously need a good bit of water but they don't like wet feet um, they like that water to be evenly spread out and evenly uh, throughout the throughout the soil profile during the times that they need it which is obviously you know filling out the nuts those sorts of times um, typically when we consider them to be um, moisture sensitive or moisture a lot of moisture is needed. Obviously, we want to avoid planting under power lines or near buildings. Um, we've all seen those hack jobs of pruning that the um, electric companies can come in and do and uh, really, really mess up the shape of a tree, uh, really cause issues with uh, probably maybe even a safety issue, putting a lot of weight on one side of the tree with their kind of, um, with that electrical pruning just coming down one side on the power line side and just kind of pruning off every limb on one side, leaving it a lot of weight on, on the opposite side of that tree. Um, you don't want to do it near buildings, obviously. It's a very large tree. It needs a lot of place room for roots, so you don't want those roots going in any type of drainage lines or water lines or septic lines, anything like that. You don't want the roots trying to go underneath your um, underneath your foundation or your driveway, stuff like that. So uh, you wanna make sure you, you plant those away from any roads or uh, driveways or areas where you're planning on using a, maybe not concrete drives, but even if you're planning on driving over the soil um, in a natural area, you don't wanna compact that root area because it, again, when it's filling out a, any type of fruit tree or nut tree like that where water's, um, very important. You want to make sure that you don't compact that soil to limit those roots and uh, negatively affect those roots. Again, they can become a very large tree, uh, so we need to make sure that we plant them plenty apart. Uh, sometimes you can get away with planting them 40 to 60 foot on 50 to 60 foot spacings, but you're more than likely, if you have multiple trees, once they get to be uh, mature, you're probably going to have to go in there and thin those out and kind of cut out every other tree. So we typically say on for homeowners to plant uh, 50 to 75 feet apart just to make that way you don't have to come back in um, and prune or cut any of them down. Um, a lot of times commercial pr production, they will, they'll plant them a little closer together to get those, um, get that high yields out of those when they're young trees and they're producing large and then once they kind of get mature, they can go in and prune them out and still maintain that same amount of, uh, of yield or production. So, so once we get think about where we're gonna plant, we need to think about what we're planting. Um, these varieties that I've looked here or that I've listed here are typically for South Mississippi recommendation, recommended for South Mississippi. Um, there are some that are uh, that are for northern Mississippi or other areas as well, uh, but these are typically focused on just South Mississippi. 
uh, and I've got some resources that I'll slide at the end with the resources that I've kind of got this information from, uh, as well as I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Eric Staffney as well. He's our fruit and nut specialist for Mississippi. Um, he's in Poplarville off at the USDA office there in Poplarville. He was kind enough to share his, um, a presentation that he has um, put together on pecans. He shared that with me and I kind of went through it and pick and chose some of the some of the information out of that that was more homeowner related as compared to commercial related and put these in and made my own presentation out of his. So I uh, appreciate him sending me that very much. Um, so if you have any real commercial questions or real intricate questions, he would be a great source. And obviously if you, you know, get in touch with your county agent, we'll be more than happy to either get in touch with him if you're uh, got a, you know, a commercial production or if you've got an orchard or something that you're looking to rejuvenate or wanting to start. So he would be a great resource and is always happy to help me, I know. Uh, but a lot of these newer varieties, um, have a lot of built-in disease resistance, which is very important for um, for homeowners because once these things get to be large trees, insect and disease control can often become very, very difficult. Again, a lot of homeowners aren't don't have the equipment or the tools or uh, or maybe even the safety the safety gear to be able to apply insecticides and uh, pesticides or fungicides and you know, in a 50 foot tall, uh, on a 50 foot tall tree. So it can become a safety issue and a health concern trying to get an insecticide or fungicide up that high, um, you know, breathing that stuff in, or it can cause issues with drift, trying to use a, the wrong equipment to, to spray in a subdivision if you're trying to spray with a pressure washer or something like that, which I don't recommend at all. Um, so, you know, just be aware that you can, you know, you can have some liability issues if you're out there spraying herbicides or insecticides and you kill some beehives or, you know, even worse, some pets, something like that. So of your neighbors and uh, you're spraying on a wind's blowing or something like that. So these are a couple of varieties that are available to us today that are very homeowner, non-commercial production, South Mississippi varieties that are good to choose. Um, again, there are a couple others, but these are uh, some of the ones that are more focused towards South Mississippi. Um, we can, a lot of these are, can be considered older varieties. Uh, there are some Jackson, and um, Kiowa, and some other things that are, um, that don't have such great disease resistance built into them. Uh, but they were planted years and years ago in large numbers in large orchards, and they were the popular um, they were the popular varieties to be planted in. So a lot of times those are some of the varieties that we see in homeowners instances that were already mature trees that are forty to fifty years old already. Um, so determining your particular variety that you have can sometimes be difficult, and a lot of times it's just based off of um, what was popular during the time that we think that tree was planted. So I know a lot of places, a lot of people also have um, just native pecan trees too, uh, just seedling pecans that have come up. Uh, they've, you know, a nut's been on the ground and um, germinated and turned into a tree. And in that sense, since you really don't know what you've got, you've just got a native pecan. So it could be um, fertilized and by, and you can have a cross between a couple of trees. So you may not have a grafted tree, uh, which a lot of times these are grafted, uh, vegetatively propagated. So uh, that's how we, they ensure uh, the purity of these, of these particular varieties. So what we need to do prior to planting, we wanna make sure we do a soil test is basically we've preached probably on 95% of our presentations when it comes to anything soil related and planting, um, you know, obviously extension, we offer soil tests. We're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna try to push push it because it is very valuable to you. 
Uh, it's very inexpensive and it offers you a lot of information and basically it's going to give you a good head start on a successful planning. So we want to make sure we take our soil test of the area we're looking to plant. Uh, we need to make sure we adjust that pH level to the desired level of six to six and a half. Sometimes we can get a little bit higher than that for the desired range. Um, so, you know, it, at a minimum of six, sometimes you can also say up to seven uh, is desirable for pecan. So you've got a pretty wide range there. You just, you just don't want it super acidic like you would for blueberries or something. So you don't see a lot of blueberries planted in pecan orchards and you don't see a lot of pecans planted in blueberry orchards. So um, then we need to make sure we add any nutrients up to our normal levels. So if we have something that is low on our soil test report, we want to make sure that we, uh, that we fix those levels and get those back up into the, the normal range. Um, make sure it's not deficient or not low or very low. And then obviously we, we can test for nitrogen, but again, we don't want to really add nitrogen pre-plant. Uh, typically a lot of times in the soil that we're, that we've got the pecan growing in, whether if it's a, not a bare root tree, or a lot of times there's enough nutrient nitrogen within the roots itself already to supply for that first year. Um, so we don't really want to take the risk of burning the, burning the roots up with some, with a large nitrogen application when it's still young and when we first put it in the ground. So we need to make sure we choose a healthy tree from a reputable, reputable nursery or a reputable source. Um, you know, it can be, like I said, it can be a potted tree or it can be a, um, you know, you can find these a lot of times in bare roots. Um, I got a couple of, I see a, something popping up here for a question. Um, North Mississippi varieties. I'll have to look that up again. I've got a slide here on the at the end of my presentation um, that has some links to a homeowner pecan publication we have that has them all listed. Um, and again, this thing is uh, the presentation is posted on that Google Drive, so you can go ahead. It should be able to go ahead and download that presentation and be able to just click the link within that. Uh, within that file and it should take you to the website. But if not, I'll post the, um, the link to it once I get to the end of the presentation. So, um, Mr. John, since the feeder roots are down to a depth of about six feet, what depth do I take to soil sample for a pecan tree? Uh, typically still the same, you, you know, the majority of uh, the feeder roots are gonna be in that top 18 to uh, 24 inches. So you're still basically, Want to do the same, probably six to eight in, at six to ten inches or so uh, on a soil test. There's really, you know, there's no sense in going any deeper than that. There's not going to be a whole lot of nutrients down there. That's just basically um, a lot of structural roots, and um, you know they are opportunistic. So if there are some nutrients that uh, that get past those uh, those top 18 inches or so, they will catch them typically, but. Um, for the most part, it's you're still going to want to do the same, um, maybe a little bit deeper than if you're doing grass or turf area or your, you know, your yard. Um, but again, you want to choose a healthy tree from a reputable nursery. Um, you know, don't be afraid to, if it is in a pot, if it's a one gallon or two gallon tree, don't be afraid to kind of pull that tree out, look at those roots, make sure it's not uh, root bound. The roots aren't. Um, curled up in there and wrapping around inside the pot and been growing in that pot for too long or kept in that pot for too long. Um, and you want to make sure they're good white healthy roots, not brown and oh you know just rotted looking or uh, anything like that. You want to make sure they're kind of light colored, whitish, good young healthy roots. Um, and then after we do that, obviously we don't want to make sure we want to make sure the roots don't dry out. So while we're um, looking to plant prior to planting, which typically we want to plant most all of our trees, typically in that February to April, depending on your location, maybe in the coastal, you can get away with late February. Um, and then as far as you know, 
may need to move it up to late April for the northern Mississippi. Uh, but we're just trying to do that to, to get that tree established and get it uh, get it established in its new home prior to the onset of typically our hot and dry season, uh, which kind of starts in May and June. We start getting those higher temperatures and possibly running into some drier times. So it just reduces that shock on that tree and those roots when you're putting it in and it's getting good rainfall, the, the soil's not super hot, the air's not super hot, super dry. Um, so basically we wanna make sure, that, you know, if we're, if we're buying them prior to current planting, we wanna make sure that we don't let those roots dry out. Um, and then once we get ready to plant this tree, uh, we wanna trim off any bruised or broken roots that may be on in the, root ball, if it's a bare root tree or in a potted tree. Uh, a potted tree, we wanna make sure that we bust up that root ball, uh, take some, a knife or something or a machete and just kind of hack around that root ball a few times just to um, trim off some of those roots and give, give new growing points for those roots. Um, and then once we, obviously we wanna make sure we dig a deep hole deep enough and wide enough to accept the root or the root ball uh, without bending and breaking all those roots um, and then once we get do that basically we're going to trim off the top half of our pecan tree uh, the above ground portion um, I know you're just saying well I just paid big money for this two and a half foot tall tree why am I going to cut it down to a foot and a half or a foot and three quarters or whatever it may be um, you know but basically we're wanting to even off that, um, that root growth or even out that root growth to the shoot growth. Uh, balance that out to where we don't have a large amount of, um, of roots supporting a small amount of tree, which that would be better than a large, small amount of roots trying to support a, uh, a very large top portion of the plant. Uh, so we wanna make sure we kind of balance that out and give that, plant and um, a good good opportunity to establish itself as um, basically and we're and then from that point we can start to train that tree um, based off of the, the central leader that we're looking for on a on a on a pecan tree so um, so once we've got it in the ground um, Again, we wanna make sure we do any pre-plant fertilizing according to our soil test. Um, and obviously a soil test is best to do every, we recommend every three years, uh, but on something like pecan, where if, especially if you're looking to, for it to produce very well, uh, you know, every two years or so may be a little better option. Uh, but without doing a soil test, these are kind of your our basic guidelines is what we recommend doing. Uh, so after, at the end of the first year, these are basically at the end of the year, of year one. So basically we plant that, uh, we put that pecan tree in the ground, just say March of 2020. Uh, this recommendation of year one would be March 2021 is when we would do this, or February 2021. Um, you know, we don't, really, again, we don't really want to put a bunch of, a bunch of fertilizer or a bunch of nitrogen out uh, and encourage a lot of growth while it's still trying to get established. So year one, after year one, we want to put about a pound of a complete fertilizer, um, which in this case is a triple 10. If you're going to use something like a triple 13 or a triple 17, you may want to cut that down just a hair. Uh, if it's triple 17, obviously you want, may want to cut it in about half. Uh, so maybe about a half a pint or a half a pound of triple 17. Uh, triple eight, you may want to use a pint and a little bit more because it's just a little bit weaker, but um, a pound is typical and a, a good recommendation, a good starting point. But typically we recommend putting it in a band around the trunk, um, six inches away. Obviously after year one, you're not going to have a big tree. So uh, you can't really say the drip line of the tree because the drip line of the tree is probably going to be within, not far from the trunk. Um, but you do want to make sure you, you split that application typically um, one time at bud break, which is typically going to be March or April, sometime in that 
pecans can sometimes be a little later to the party than a lot of our other trees. They're the ones that uh, you, you typically don't see bud break until um, right at the, right at, sure enough, pretty much after the last frost has passed. So, um, and then you want to do the remainder uh, during the growing season or around May or June. So, you know, uh, probably six to eight weeks after you do your initial fertilization of uh, in March or sometime around then. Year two, we want to up that fertilizer uh, to two to three pounds. Uh, we want to put it all out before bud break. So in this instance, we may um, put it out in late February, uh, early March, while there's still a chance of, we want it to be there when the plant um, basically is, is want it to be there waiting on the plant when it gets ready or when it's ready to, to break bud. So um, again, typically a band is, is the best portion. Uh, a lot of times if we see a broadcast fertilization, you know, a broadcast application, a lot of that is gets taken up by weeds or by our turf underneath. So if you can put it in a band uh, a, two, two feet or so away from the trunk um, or more, a little bit more than two feet, you know, you just want to make sure you're not putting it on the trunk and right up next to the trunk to where, um, where you're possibly burning that tree or burning those roots. But typically just in a little, in a band is going around the trunk is, is what's recommended for pecans. Um, now a lot of people will take a post hole digger and dig some random holes around, get it below the roots of, um, of the turf or you know some other weeds or something that may be growing in underneath the drip line of that tree. Um, don't see a lot of, lot of case for that. Um, you know, it's obviously not hurting anything uh, but it's really not not helping anything either. So it's really not worth the trouble of going through all that and digging a bunch of random holes underneath your tree and possibly harming some some roots. So I would just recommend putting it out in a in a band. Year three is kind of when you really want to make sure um, is that we put out some zinc. Um, so like year three is when we're going to want to start doing some. Um, another soil test and possibly even some tissue analysis. Um, basically what that is, is we grab some leaves off of this year's new growth, uh, fully formed leaves, not at the, not the brand new leaves, but the ones just before the brand new ones, uh, first fully formed or the newest fully formed leaves. Uh, we want to take random samples from off of that tree, off of all sides, send them in. Uh, they will, analyze them and we can compare those and see what the nutrient levels are actually within the tree to see how well that tree is taking up those nutrients and able to um, to use those nutrients. So um, at this point we may want to start thinking about getting into some plant analysis and comparing soil tests as well as um, nutrient analysis or plant tissue analysis to kind of see what's going on with the tree, how efficient it is at at picking up those nutrients from the soil and making sure and through the soil test, we can make sure those, those nutrients are there for the tree. And then obviously after uh, year four and after, uh, we best typically just want to use leaf analysis. Um, but, um, you know, obviously soil tests are, I'm sorry, um, soil tests are still going to be recommended, but uh, just to make sure you're not over applying nutrients or anything like that. But our plant tissue analysis typically in July is the best time that we recommend um, doing these plant, taking the samples and submitting them. That gives us the time when the plant is truly growing well uh, in full, full force, but it's also not so late in the year. If we waited till now, that tree has kind of started taking nutrients out of the leaves, putting them into the nuts. Uh, so we would possibly see some deficiencies or the tree may be putting some things back into storage for uh, to get ready to sh shut down for the cooler weather as these days start getting shorter and shorter. That tree is uh, accustomed to being able to tell that and it starts taking nutrients out of the leaves. So it may give us some false, false indications of some issues that, that aren't really there. Um, got a couple of questions here. Um, recommend using glyphosate for weed control under a tree. Definitely. Uh, it's a great, 
great tool to use. Um, it's a good one, uh, very safe to use as long as you, you know, you make sure you don't get it on any of the parts of the tree, the trunk or the leaves of the tree itself. Um, you know, apply it according, obviously according to the label. Um, who does leaf analysis? Uh, we offer that through, um, through the extension service. I think it's 12 or $15 if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's been a while since I've done one. Um, obviously, pecans used to be a very big industry here in Mississippi and uh, a lot of the hurricanes and some disease stuff has, um, has caused some issues with our production uh, here in Mississippi. So uh, it's not as great as it once was thought to be here. Um, now we've had, do have some success in some areas, uh, but it's a lot of times you see some over in the Delta or Indianola pecan company, things like that, where they have super deep soils, rich Delta soils. Um, and, um, you know, so it's just, and it takes a lot of management. Again, our hot, dry summers, you gotta be able to irrigate, you gotta be able to um, spray, and you've also got to be able to do a lot of fungicide or disease uh, treatments, like I said. So you gotta have the equipment to spray. So, so looking at some common issues that homeowners see on their pecan trees or, um, uh, the, the one I get the most calls for is obviously pecan phylloxera. Uh, I get calls about this every, every summer, and unfortunately I wish I could get them every spring because that's when we typically want to spray for them, um, and that's typically when we have to spray for them. Once we see these galls and have these galls on a fully formed leaf, it's too late to treat anything for them this year. Um, not sure why I've got pecan phylloxera, that coat hanger on there. I obviously, I, um, got, I mistakenly put that on there instead of for web worms, but uh, ignore the coat hanger. Um, that's not gonna help anything to do with pecan phylloxera. Um, so basically an insecticide spray timed correctly is the only way we can control uh, pecan phylloxera, which is a, it's an insect, um, they, they overwinter and they produce, they overwinter typically in the bark of the tree and then they'll come and they'll lay eggs um, within these galls. They will raise their first and second uh, generation female insects within these galls. Uh, and then the third generation is typically made up of males and females and then they will kind of repeat this process. So we have to spray for these when that new growth is between or up to three quarters of an inch. Um, typically we like to see about a half to three quarters of an inch of new growth or leaf uh, growth before we, or when we spray. So, you know, you don't want to do it before bud break and you don't want to wait till it's already fully formed leaves because you're too late. Um, and really the only times we really need to treat these is if it was a real bad year last year, heavily infested, or some trees nearby have been heavily infested, that's gonna um, indicate that there is a high population of them in the area. So, um, but these are cyclic. So, um, you know, some years are bad, some years they're not so bad. Um, kind of just depends. There's really no way to know uh, which one it's gonna be, but this can be very, very devastating to a to a pecan tree, uh, both production wise and aesthetics wise. Um, it can be quite ugly on the tree, and you know a lot of homeowners are just concerned that it's going to kill the tree. Which typically it doesn't get that bad, but some years it it, it definitely can. So it's not that it can't happen, but it typically doesn't. So. But like I said, once you get to this point, it's a little too late to do anything with it. So uh, just expect a little bit of uh, maybe a production decrease. Um, but, you know, again, it's typically not going to kill your tree. Uh, it just may be something that you need to, to think about doing next year, which, again, can be some issues because of homeowners and the ability to spray these trees, uh, be able to 
effectively spray these trees. Again, you go out there with a little one gallon sprayer, I don't think you're gonna reach the top of a full mature tr spray tree. And if you do, you're probably inhaling some of it. You're getting it on the neighbors, uh, going across, getting blown across the yard to the neighbor's yard, uh, causing issues. So uh, a lot of times we're just kind of stuck. And that's why, I'm, again, variety selection is extremely important um, within all of this when we're selecting. Uh, pecan scab is our next big um, big issue that homeowners see. Uh, this is something that uh, you kind of have to do preventatively, whether you think it's going to be bad or not. Um, we kind of see this start to form on the leaves and on the twigs um, early within the year. So we have to kind of start treatments whether or not we think it's going to be a bad year or not. We don't really know. So uh, if there's a lot of rain, it can be issues because a, a lot of rain and moisture um, encourages the growth of this fungus, but it also washes off your fungicide treatment. So you have to spray more often. Um, so you know it's kind of a kind of a catch twenty two. Um, basically, this pecan scab can be very damaging. We can you know not get uh, not the shucks not open. Uh, the nut not fill out, um, or we can actually get the leaves start dropping off of our pecan tree, typically. Uh, those are all very common instances and very common side effects of this disease. Uh, again, fungicide spray, timely, um, often and early, um, can be an issue for homeowners again, but um, again, the best, best treatment is just to select a variety that has uh, scab resistance built in, which is very common in most all of the newer varieties. This is such a damaging disease that this can be bred into or, you know, genetically um, within the varieties. So, um, again, the phylloxera may not be, but um, it's, since it's an insect, it's not going to be a typically a, um, a variety issue on that but it can be a management issue. So again, so the third and final kind of pest that most homeowners are gonna run into is webworms. A lot of, we see this a lot in pecans and hickories and um, you know, we see it going down the road on some persimmons and some other things as well. Um, it's typically not very damaging to the tree as far as its health, uh, as far as it's not gonna kill your tree. Uh, it's just kind of aesthetically un unpleasing, uh, unappealing. We hit, have a couple of options as to how to get rid of these. Uh, you can use just, uh, just like a coat hanger on the end of a long bamboo pole or something like that. Uh, put a little hook in it, in your wire, open those, um, open that web up to allow birds to get in there to those caterpillars to, um, to feed on those. Um, insecticide treatments when possible. Again, I know that can be a problem depending on the size of the tree and where these are located within the tree. Um, and then we also want, can use removal. So basically just going just beyond that, the, that cluster of uh, web there uh, using a pole saw or a pole clippers, something like that, a little uh, extendable pole, trimming that little portion off and discarding it or letting your chickens get a hold to it, some, you know, throwing it in there into your chicken pen or uh, using it for fishing bait even works well too. So as I always say, you know, most all of mine, when we talk about pesticides and herb herbicides or fungicide, insecticide use, I'll obviously always read the label. The label is the law. Read it don't, and follow it. Don't just read it, but also follow it. Um, you know, mix according to the label. Make sure any of your, uh, your formulations are labeled for the use that you're planning to use. So in this instance, it would need to be um, put on a food crop or a, uh, a nut crop. Uh, it would have to be labeled for that and make sure we wear all required PPP. Again, that's going to be extremely important in this instance because of um, the height that we're trying to get that uh, pesticide up to. Um, 
And a lot of times these pecan, or most times these pecan uh, growers, they have blowers that can use, that can use two to 300 gallons of water per acre, um, putting out a high volume and a blow, blow that product up 35, 40 feet in the air. Um, but again, they're usually using cab um, tractors to do this in. They're not just out in the open doing it with it falling on them, uh, misting them as well. So safety is the number one priority. And again, that can sometimes be tough to do when trying to apply um, something at this level. What causes small holes all the way around the trunk of the tree? Uh, typically, when, we, when I see that, I think of sap suckers. Um, that's usually a bird that is coming around, punching these little holes, uh, basically using these as um, to find food. So he will go around, punch these, looks like little hole punches all the way around the bark. Uh, insects, will, the tree will exude a sap within those holes. Insects will get caught in that sap and the bird will come back by and hunt for his, see what, see what he's caught in his traps uh, the next day or over the next following day. So um, I typically don't see these killing trees all that often unless it's a very, very um, high, highly infestated, infestated tree. And typically it's gonna be more of an insect issue that's killed your tree <coughs> more so than the sap sucker itself. Uh, but they can, uh, they can in, introduce some disease problems and allow insects and disease to come in. So, but uh, there are some products as far as like a tanglefoot product, uh, like a sticky, gluey type substance that sometimes recommended for to rub on the bark of the tree, and it gets on the um, kind of like a woodpecker. He sits on the side of the trunk of the tree. He gets that substance on his feet. He don't like it. Um, and, um, you know, typically he'll leave your tree alone a lot of times, but sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. So um, insecticide drenches that might work, uh, that is not typically you, insecticide drenches are typically not used for um, food crops. Um, so, you know, that, that they're gonna have too long of a PHI uh, to be viable for, um, again, we can use the, the, the product that is in it, imidacloprid in a lot of these drenches, is labeled for uh, insect control, but it's not used as a drench. So, um, oh, and I apologize, I just see that was a private message. So, um, I apologize for that, but um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, unfortunately, we typically, our drenches aren't labeled for, for food crops. So, they just have too long of a, um, or if we have to do it, it's not, we can do it, but it's too early or it's too, it, it sticks around too long. So it's not the right time to, to be able to do it, but um, hope that helps. And again, here are the resources that I kind of use to put this together. Um, fertilizing pecan trees, pecans in the home landscape, uh, these links should be active, so if you download that PDF file on the iDrive, Google Drive, you should just be able to click on them, and it should take you straight to the website. Um, again, I'd like to thank Dr. Staffney, Eric Staffney, for sending me his presentation to go through and to use as a template, kind of. Um, but his was about 50 or 60 slides long, as mine is about 13, so I think that would have been a little more than what we were really bargaining for today. Um, but he does have a great website too as well that he has got a lot of, a uh, lot of great, all of, most all of his fruit and nut publications are listed there uh, as well as his, uh, you know, he, he just gives his anecdotal information, uh, tells you kind of what's going on in the fruit and nut world, what kind of stuff he has going. Um, it's just kind of his blog website um, that he kind of has going on his own, but it does have links to other extension services. I believe he is from Oklahoma State or 
Oklahoma, one of the two. I can't really remember exactly, but I apologize. Um, but he has a, he did a lot of research there as well. So he's got stuff on grapes and muscadines and any kind of fruit and nut that you can think of. So I'd highly recommend you go to that website. Use his website as well. So that's really all I've got for today. I see that Google Drive uh, Christian reposted that link. Uh, thank you, Christian, for doing.